Hi. Thanks so much for showing up today. I really appreciate it. Um, my name is Arthi. Um, I'm trying to get cozy to some, some success, limited success. Um, I use they, them pronouns. Uh, let's see, what do you need to know about me? I, um, I live on the unceded Musqueam Squamish and Tsleil-Waututh um, territories, usually, which is Vancouver. Um, but today I'm actually in Toronto. Um, and Toronto is the lens of the Mississaugas of the Credit, Anishinaabe, Chippewa, Haudenosaunee, and Wendat people. Um, yeah. Um, so I actually lead a fair bit at Queer Sangha, um, a couple, usually like at least, I don't know, once a month-ish or so, maybe less than that. Um, so some of you are familiar to me. Uh, Queer Sangha is um, an organization that's under uh, the umbrella of a larger organization called True North Insight. Um, and it was through True North Insight that I was able to do a mentorship program on becoming um, a leader of the Dharma. And so that's that's what I bring here today. I also um, am a, I also am really nerdy about somatics and I've done some somatic experiencing training and have also had a whole bunch of therapy training. So that's the context of what you're about to do right now. <laughs> um, okay, so what's gonna happen today is I'm gonna talk at you for quite a while, um, for about half an hour, and then we're gonna do a little sit and then there should be time for questions. Um, yeah, and just discussion if anyone has anything to say. Okay, so today I'm going to be talking about friendship breakups. And as terribly discombobulating and awful as they can be, they can also be a possible path to liberation, as can any anything that arises in our lives can be a path to liberation. It can be a possible path to surrender to the dharmic laws of impermanence. So what a conundrum it is to be a human in this world. We need connection, right? We need to belong to other people, but we also need protection. Other people can cause us harm. You know, we can also get engulfed by other people and it can be hard to kind of carve out our own individual sense of self. So we need that. We need, uh, we need, we need trust, right? We need to know, will you be there for me? Will you also allow me to be free? Um, and is there consistency with that over time? So a definition of trust I really like is a reliance on reliability. But the thing is, is that trust is actually an inherent risk, right? Trust is an engagement with the unknown. A favorite astrologer of mine on Instagram, Queer Cosmos, um, quotes Adam Phillips, who says, trust is a risk masquerading as a promise. And I love that so much. Um, I know we're all different, but for me, that's definitely how this works. Like I'll meet someone, I'll get that like very cute, crushy friend, new relationship energy. I call it ooey gooey energy. And I'm just like, I'm all in. I'm like, okay, I'm really into you. Let's just talk and talk and talk and talk and talk. And it's so exciting. And maybe like a year later, there'll be a moment of mistrust, but I start from a place of trust. And then I'm like, oh, now I don't trust you at all. Um, and it's that, that, it's that thing about um, risk masquerading as a promise. And I know it's different for other people. Some people come into connection starting with a place of untrustworthiness, but that's that's what it was for me. And I really, that definition really hit me in a place of like, oh yeah, I minimize the risk of, re of relationship often. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so we try and trust by basically engineering the risk out of the equation, right? Um, so what are some of the ways we do that? Well, in typical in, in the typical ways that the Buddha describes, right? We cling to what feels good. So we might cling to that ooey gooey energy um, and we lean away from what doesn't feel good. We, we, you know, we sometimes will run acrobats around what doesn't feel good as a way to avoid it. Like, oh, potential rejection. I just won't connect with that person because they might reject me. Um, or whatever, or like, um, I'm going to just kind of avoid what looks like a red flag because I don't want to really want to be conscious of it. 
So we can end up in a tailspin. We start fleeing from life instead of learning to be with the ups and downs of this relational life that we're living. And I'm not saying that we should stick with people who are untrustworthy, you know, that we should just kind of like double down, um, even though we know someone isn't trustworthy. Um, it's important that when we feel those feelings that we pay attention to them, that's important information. But our feelings themselves are also not very reliable, right? Our feelings come and go, they change all the time. And so it's important to have discernment. It's important to have um, some discernment that comes from wisdom and that doesn't come from reactivity. Reactivity will push and pull us around and discernment comes from a much more grounded, wise place. Okay, so there is nothing like a friendship breakup to show us that we cannot engineer the risk out of relationship, right? Going good, going steady, and then all of a sudden it's not. There's the risk showing up. So how do we trust when there's inherent risk? Well, especially given that we are queer people, trans people, two-spirit people, many of, us, many of us have personal histories of mistrust, right? With our families of origin, um, sometimes kicking us out of our homes or kind of just, you know, or even just like kind of emotionally excluding us, you know, maybe not asking about our partners or like not respecting our pronouns or things like that. And then we're granted this promise of queer chosen family, right? Um, you know, other people who've also experienced homophobia and transphobia, they've experienced what I've experienced. And so, you know, they should have my back in a particular way and, and coded under that is in a more permanent way than maybe my, my biological family, right? So then when mistrust happens and suddenly it all falls apart, it cuts in a much deeper way and also cuts in the place where we were already cut, you know? And then we've got our own attachment trauma, you know, um, that's like right when, from when we're born to when we're three years old, that initial relational patterning that we get from our parents, not all of us had safe parents. And so we learn how to be in relationship um, in these ways that are quite insecure. And then we can bring that patterning to our adult relationships. Then we've got ancestral histories of trauma that protect us through the mistrust of our ancestors. We've got mistrust with the state who continues to treat us like absolute shit, right? Especially trans people right now. And then we live in capitalism, right? Which is like a culture of mistrust. It's a culture where we're competing for our basic needs. And so it's really hard to trust each other. It's not a culture of abundance. And I'm sure there are many, many other layers of mistrust that we're swimming in. Like it's a lot. So how do we feel safe enough in human connection then? How do we be with the humanness of inconsistency? How do we remain heart-centered in connection while proceeding with caution? While also developing resilience to rejection, to breakups, to disappointments, without pushing away all of life. So how do we find this middle path? How do we be in the risk of connection? So no matter what, we are um, going to need humans. We're gonna need each other. Interdependence is real and really important in, Buddha, in the Buddhist path. Um, we can't spiritually bypass our way out of connecting with other people. But I'm, some of my teachings have taught me that, you know, we can place all of these kind of like small human connections, these foibles, these conundrums, and place them in a larger container of faith. Faith allows us to be with the ever-changing flow of nature. That anxiety of groundlessness can sit in that larger container of faith. So um, the language of the Buddha is Bali, and the Bali word for trust is Shaddha. And the definition of Shaddha in English is to lay our heart upon. And I love that definition so much when I first read it um, or heard it, I think. Um, it just gives me the sense of like, ah, uh, I don't have to do this trust thing alone. Like I can rest my heart somewhere. I can surrender into this thing. Um, and I can just like ugh, let go a little bit and not have to be so rigid about human connections. So 
So one of my favorite um, Buddhist books is um, this one here. It's um, Sharon Salzberg book, um, Faith. And the, the little byline here is trusting your own deepest experience. So for her, that's the definition of faith. And that's really different than kind of our colloquial understanding of faith, right? Um, so when we think about faith and in other religious contexts, we think about an adherence to rules, right? There's some rules out there. If we follow them, we've got faith. Or um, a submission to an external authority like a god. You know, if we bow down to this god, then we have faith. And that's not how Buddhists understand faith. Um, she talks about, again, faith as trusting your own deepest experience. Um, it's about laying our hearts upon something. It's not, sorry, it, it is not about laying our hearts upon something outside of our own experiences, but deeply understanding the truths of our experience. And it is on those truths that we can rely. It's a place where we can rest our hearts. And so this is where our practice comes in, our meditation practice. What we're doing when we're meditating is we aim to courageously meet every experience as it's arising without clinging, without aversion, to meet each experience with kindness and curiosity. And the point of it is to watch the arising and passing of phenomena without grasping and without pushing it away, just being with it. And so what we learn from the practice itself, from our own experience, um, what we learn over time is this deeper truth of impermanence, that experience, phenomena, they come and they go, but what we can always rely on is that everything changes. And it's faith that allows us, it's that, it's that ability to trust in our own deepest experience that allows us to be with the ever-changing flow of nature. Yeah, so ironic, right? Because the basically the thing that we can trust on, the th thing that we can trust into and the thing that we can um, like feel stable in and feel like this is real and concrete and true is instability itself. Hmm. And we don't learn this from books. You, you know, you can kind of learn this cognitively from what I'm saying, but really truly we learn it from our deepest experience, from sitting on the cushion, from our walking practice because trust is a practice and faith is a practice. And it's also a relational practice, right? We learn this in our day-to-day -day lives of being in connection with other people. So I'm going to share a story with you of my journey of wrestling with a friendship breakup. Um, and it's the story of me trying to lay my heart upon so many false refuges, mostly the refuges of clinging in a version that I've been talking about in my thoughts. Um, and I will tell you about how unsatisfying those refuges were for me, but I did eventually get to a place of surrendering and impermanence. And my intention in sharing this story is to um, hopefully in some way support your own faith and trust journeys. Okay. So um, I see that there's some things in the chat, but I'm not gonna pay attention to them until afterwards. Feel free to chat. I'm just gonna wait until I'm done. Um, okay. So I had a dear, dear friend, um, one of the truest, truest loves of my life, um, a beautiful, beautiful walker on this Buddhist path, um, lives with a lot of integrity. And I really feel like there's actually a big age difference between us, but I feel like we really raised each other on this Buddhist path. Um, unfolding into our queer and trans adult selves, um, you know, learning our political analyses together, really being in relational dhamma, true as chosen family, or as um, we say in Buddhism, a galimitta, which translates to a spiritual friend. Um, and after 10 years of really deep intimacy, um, I would say like platonic partnership, our friendship started falling apart. And there's a lot of people in the Zoom room today, so I know that we can relate to this deep, deep heartbreak of, of friendships falling apart. So yeah, how did I manage this heartbreak? How did I succumb to the risk of relationship? Um, not well, not very skillfully. <laughs> 
So um, my favorite strategy showed up, my condition strategy showed up, and those for me are always aversive. Um, so pushing life away, right? So I was doing that through anger, judgment, blame. These are very well-practiced strategies for me. So first, um, I decided that my friend was bad and wrong, you know? Um, you know, they, they're a white person and they were using all of these like white communication strategies, like and lots of like white fragility and um, like indirect communication. So I'm so mad about racism. I was like mad about their freeze response and how there was like no access to them. I didn't feel like they were showing up for me in the ways that were needed. I didn't feel like they knew how to do conflict. So much blame and aggression. And I want to say that all those things are true. I can say that those things were definitely true. But what was unskillful about it is that I didn't just like notice it and let it go, let it drop away. I stewed in it. I practiced it. My meditation practice for, I don't know, months was just me practicing over and over and over again, this aversion. And I know we all do this, right? Like how many of us have had a fake conflict with our friend in our head? We'll spend hours just being in a conflict with our bestie, you know, not actually talking to them about it, but just doing it. Oh, they're going to say this. And I'm going to say this. And this is, this is a practice too. It's not a skillful practice, but it's a practice. Um, and then we're, then we, then we learn how to be aversive as we practice that. So the skillful thing to do in that moment is to drop it. But when that energy is there, it's like so easy to say, just let it go. But it's really, really hard to let it go, right? Right. So, so why did I get stuck here? What purpose did it serve me? Um, well, I got to lay my heart upon something that felt concrete and true and sure, right? Um, that's the false refuge piece. Instead of laying my heart on in faith, I was laying my heart on in aversion. When I could just kind of stay with my friend is bad, then I could stay with the story. This hard thing is happening because my friend is bad. Not that suffering happens, not that this is just the first noble truth expressing itself, that there is suffering, but that there's something about this person that's making this happen. And so then I can put, put, place blame there. And what that allows for me is to, um, is to um, make a story so that I know that I can control that this incredible pain won't happen again because I figured it out. I've packaged it in a story. Um, I'm going to get the closure that I need by creating the story. And then I'm going to be able to put it away and escape the pain. When really it was, it, really, it was the grief that I just didn't know how to be with. The grief of this profoundly life-changing foundational relationship ending. The grief that the promise of clinging to the concept of chosen family, that that just didn't work out for me. The fear of what this means for future connections, the terror of mistrust about, real, about having relationships across racial difference. All that stuff was so overwhelming. Blame just felt a lot easier to be with, you know? And then after a while that got tiring and then I got stuck in a new narrative. So anger for me is kind of my go-to, that kind of fight response is my go-to response, that aversive response. And sometimes it gets directed outwards and sometimes it gets directed inwards. And so then I went into a story of, okay, it's me, I'm bad and wrong. And this is a very well-practiced narrative again about my own unworthiness and my own unlovability. Um, so a place of deep despair and shame. It's like the narrative that I got stuck on is if I let someone see all the parts of me, the anger that leads to all of this unskillful action and the blaming and all of these defenses that make me completely intolerable, <laughs> but also very human that if someone actually is present with all those things, they'll leave me. And once someone gets close to me, they're inevitably gonna have to see all of those horrible parts. So therefore I'm inherently unlovable. Like it's just impossible to get close to me. Oh, it's very much a self-reinforcing narrative and really difficult to come out of. So it's like, well, then why would I, like, that sounds horrible. Why am I, why is my body choosing to do that? 
there must be some benefit, you know? And again, it's a solid place to rest my heart. There's something sure about that. There's something concrete about it. It's not pleasant, but it's sure, you know, it's still unlovability is still an answer to a thing that felt just so nonsensical, like losing this relationship felt so nonsensical. Um, but of course there are downsides, right, to doing this. Like when I was concretizing that I am bad and that's why this has gone wrong, um, I can't accept the love of my friend in my heart because I'm, I'm not worthy of love. And yet for 10 years, this person deeply loved me. And in the narrative, it ha the narrative cannot be complex when I'm concretizing like that. The narrative is just, I'm bad. And so, you know, um, for a really long time, that friend was, was either a meta object for me in my practice or was a um, benefactor. And I had to stop doing that practice because I'm not worthy of loving kindness. You know, that's where the narrative took me. So I don't get to have complexity, you know, in the narrative. And without complexity, you can't have integrity. You just can't. And then those angry thoughts lead to all kinds of unhelpful thinking, like, oh, if, that, if my dearest friend can hurt me this badly, then absolutely nobody is trustworthy, right? And I had just moved to Vancouver. This is like mid-pandemic, pre-vaccine. I didn't know anyone. <laughs> and I was like sitting in my apartment being like, I guess I should try to make friends or something off of like the internet somehow. And, um, and then I would meet up with people and I was acting in these really sketchy ways because I was terrified of humans because I was learning that people are terrifying, right? Yeah, which reinforces my undesirable, uh, my unlovability narrative. So really, really stuck there. And there are a lot, a lot of costs of laying my heart upon something concrete, um, either about myself or my friend or about conflict more generally. So, you know, some, there's some, I've been practicing for a long, long time. And there was some part of me that knew like, hey, don't forget your practice, your whole Buddhist path. It's really important here. But I was just so overwhelmed with rage that I couldn't figure it out. And Luckily, I had booked myself to go on a meditation retreat, a really short one. So I'm on retreat and I am going back and forth between these false refuges, right? The false refuge of like clinging to my unlovability and pushing away my friend. Um, and, oh, it's saying that my internet connection is unstable. Are we good? Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, great. Okay. Um, so here I am on retreat, going back and forth between these refuges, these false refuges, you know, so some of the narratives are like, people should love me even when I'm being awful to them. And then there's like, uh, no, actually people should not love, me. like people need to have boundaries. I'm just really in my head about these narratives, right? And then I would have this thought like, okay, remember that things are impermanent, they'll fall apart and that's okay. But it wasn't coming from this like embodied Place. It was coming from this like deeply panicked, highly cognitive place of like trying to convince myself top down that I was going to be okay. So I, some part of me knew, you know, I'm sitting on meditation retreats, I'm doing the sitting practice and then this walking practice. And so I knew that I was supposed to just be with the bare sensation and not get stuck in the story. But even when I could access my body, it was like totally numb or it was full of terror and it, it wasn't, I couldn't do it. Like I just couldn't do the practices. It was that scary to lose this person in my life. Um, yeah, I mean, yeah, exactly. Like I knew that I knew the path was to sort of rest in the breath, get curious about what was happening, but I just couldn't do it. Um, okay. So what did I do? It was a uh, walking, it was walking meditation, um, which is a lot which is like better for me when I'm in terror, it's hard to sit with that, but like moving a little bit helps with that. And so I was, I was, you know, sobbing about my own unlovability. And then I noticed that there was this kind of mantra, this like tune that I was singing um, in the background and the tune, like the, the little chant that I was singing was kind of like, went a little bit like this, like no one ever sticks around, nothing ever sticks. You're too difficult to love. 
no one ever sticks around. Nothing ever sticks. And so I was just like walking and again, practicing my own unlovability, you know? Um, and as soon as I noticed that that's what I was doing, there was even more despair that showed up. So I was really hooked, like really, really caught. And then the bell rang, which signals that it's time to go inside and do a stationary practice, a sitting practice for most people. Um, so my shoes were all full, full of mud because I was in the woods. And so I went to go take the, them off and put on my indoor shoes. And as I did that, I saw a, there was like a whole bunch of burrs that were sticking to the inside of my calf. Um, and I don't know if people know what burrs are, but they're kind of like a little seed pod and they've got these like, um, barbs or like these pokey parts all around it. And then on the end of these little hooks. Um, it's just a piece, piece of nature. And um, they often will stick to your clothes as you're going for a hike or will stick to your um, your skin even. And so, so here I am chanting this, like nothing ever sticks to me chant. And then all of a sudden there's like literally nature is stuck to me. And as soon as I realize that that's what's happened, I just start laughing. And I haven't had a moment of levity this entire retreat, right? I'm just sitting in my misery and this moment of levity hits me. And I'm just like, wait a minute, this narrative can't be true. Here is nature intervening on this narrative. You know, it just allowed some spaciousness to, to show up in my body. Um, it helped me see that those false refuges that I was really resting in just didn't make a lot of sense. Um, and then the spaciousness allowed for some curiosity, and it didn't allow me to shift my relationship with my friend. It was more about shifting my relationship to myself in that moment, you know, shifting my relationship to, to how I was coping with fear. Um, and so I, it was time to do our, a sitting practice and I set an intention for the practice for me to just let go of the narrative, to just try to let go of the narrative. And in that practice, the narratives were still really strong, but they were slightly lessened. I could finally hear other things that were happening. And what I could feel was actually the tension in my jaw, the closing of my throat, the tightness in my chest, the tightening in my belly. I could feel all of the contraction of anger. I could finally feel into the false refuge. Suddenly there was something other than the story that was present. So suddenly all of this fighting against the way things were, against life itself that I had been doing, denying the ending of this friendship, fighting against myself and what imaginary things I thought my friend was saying and so much of aversion, it just lifted a tiny, tiny bit just by noticing it, just by being able to see it. And then in being able to see that shift, that shift from being so stuck to just slightly less stuck. I finally was able to rest my heart upon something a lot more trustworthy than the false refuges, which is impermanence. I was able to see that things change and I was able to see it from the inside out, not from a cognitive place. And I'm not saying that like after that, things with me and my friend were totally fine. You know, we, I initiated a breakup after this conversation. I, um, yeah, which is which was really the definitely the right decision, um, and I definitely fell back into my strategies of clinging and aversion, clinging and aversion, because I'm human. We all do it, you know. But then I had this evidence that something else was possible. I had this embodied experience of something else, and that that amplified my faith, you know. So I just kept practicing. Okay. Buddhist psychotherapist David Rico lays this out um, succinctly in his book, Daring to Trust. I'll show you this book. I love this book so much. I read it every year. Um, I'm sorry, it's backwards for you. <laughs> it's called Daring to Trust. Um, okay, he says, the frightened or doubting ego picks a quarrel with life's givens, demanding its right to a perfect world, the one in which it believes itself entitled. So it attempts to revamp the shape reality takes. It does this by trying to gain control. Then the fear of reality replaces trust in reality. So um, uh, Sharon, Sharon Salzberg also talks about this. Um, 
Oh yeah. And I, she's actually here, she's talking about religious beliefs, but when I read it, it really reminded me of, of like the ways in which I clung to the false refuges of clinging and aversion. Um, so I'll read this to you from that lens. With their assumptions of correctness, beliefs try to make a known out of the unknown. They make presumptions about what is yet to come, how it will be, what it will mean, and how it will affect us. Faith, on the other hand, doesn't carve out reality according to our preconceptions and desires. It doesn't decide how we are going to perceive something, but rather is the ability to move forward even without knowing. Faith, in contrast to belief, is not a definition of reality, not a received answer, but an active, open state that makes us willing to explore. Yeah, and that's what happened to me once the bird, once I had this intervention of the birds, this laughter arose, the false refuges, that kind of spell lifted. And then suddenly there was a place of exploration. I could see more things. I could feel more things in my body. So back to Rico, he says, the reality is that whether needs are met or unmet, that's beyond our control. And we have the power to survive in either circumstance. In fact, cultivating the ability to survive any conditions is more valuable for our growth than getting what we want. And what is only called this nomad, no lotus. Um, instead of grasping after each other, maybe the path of liberation for me and my friend is actually just about growing apart. And I can tell you since we've broken up, I've been able to see so much growth in myself. There was the way in which we were really deeply holding each other back and we had a very beautiful breakup in the end. And so I got to hear a little bit about how all of these years apart has actually deeply supported them on their liberation journey. So it feels really wonderful to let go and to see that sometimes it's not an utter shit show. You know? <laughs> uh, okay. So in that loosening of the grip of the aversion stories, it stopped being as important to me who was right, if there's some way we can get back together in the future, what was wrong in the past. Um, really, it just was so clear that the path, that, that this breakup was a part of my liberation journey. And it was about just watching the coming together and the falling apart, you know, in every moment. Um, it's about practicing equanimity with the flow of life. It's about resting in the continuity of the ever-changing life that's just living through us and trying to do that with some ease. What mattered was not what was happening in the past or what my, our future might be, but just what was happening right now in the present moment. And what that was, in that moment of the birth was surrendering to that natural flow of life, just watching things end, watching things change and placing my heart upon not knowing. Um, yeah. So yeah, in the end, I was really able to hold them, my friend, with love and generosity in my heart, not perfectly, Definitely not perfectly, but more so than before. And I was able to do that for myself too. And that makes me like feel really, really hopeful about what that means collectively, you know? Can you imagine what would happen if we had the capacity, all of us supporting each other, but also individually to really be present with the grief of loss without needing to blame or shame or freeze or any of our non-relational protection strategies? What could happen? You know, when we're, when we're present with something, even if it's really unpleasant, we become safe for other people. That's actually how we become trustworthy, right? By being unmoved by whatever's showing up. That's us being in our, in our integrity. So then instead of needing other people to be trustworthy so that we can feel safety, we are just the embodiment of trustworthiness. We embody integrity. And then it doesn't matter if people are trustworthy or not, because, you know, I've got my own back, but also I've got yours. I can hold it. And that energy of taking that middle path that we talk about in Buddhism 
of embodying dignity without using pow relational power over strategies, of deeply surrendering to what is, of surrendering to reality without enacting any kind of power, over, uh, power under victimization strategies. So not using power over, not using power under, but really just being present with what's here. That is a contagious energy. That is a regulated nervous system. And then when other people are showing up with dysregulation, we can offer, they can borrow some of our regulation through co-regulation. And so we can actually build cultures of trustworthiness one mindful moment at a time. So let's do a little practice. Um, we're going to practice being with impermanence. Um, so you can get into either um, a sitting, standing, lying down posture. We're just gonna sit for 10 minutes or do a practice for 10 minutes. Um, and choose a posture that allows you to have both ease and dignity. So we're trying to embody that middle path here. So we'll start by noticing the ground, the earth, noticing the parts of your body that are in contact with the earth. So this might be your seat, your thighs, your feet. It might be your back against a chair or on a bed. Maybe your head is being supported by the earth element. And on an exhale, see if you can let go into the earth even a little bit more. Letting the earth support your practice. Let's build a, a middle path container for our practice. So we can start by building a strong, dignified back. So we can imagine that there's a string just at the center of our heads. And we can pull it ever so gently to just allow our spine that sense of upward dignity, that trustworthiness. So see if you can feel into the simultaneous downward pulling of gravity of the earth really having us and also that upward pull of dignity. So that's our strong back. That's our discerning back that helps us keep out what's not working in our lives, helps protect us. And see if you can bring a receptive quality to your heart space. Noticing your breath in your chest, and sometimes it helps to place a hand on the heart. Just kind of gently encourage it to say, to just gently sort of saying, it's okay if you open a little bit. So we have the earth holding us down, our backs keeping us safe and our soft heart opening to life just as it is, surrendering here to faith. And 
and see if you can kind of pendulate back and forth between the spine energy of strength and then bring your attention to a soft energy of rest. And then back to strength. Just do that a few times at your own pace. And if you're ever lost, you can remember that the earth is here holding you and you can stay with that energy. Now we'll move practicing with the breath. So just noticing the breath wherever it's easiest, that might be belly, chest, back body, nose. Notice the ever-changing nature of breath, the impermanence of breath. Just noticing that it changes from going in and coming out. That's a change in and of itself. And see if you can notice if there is more breath in one nostril or side of belly or side of chest than the other. And is it changing? Switching nostrils or maybe the breath is slowing down or speeding up. Maybe it's longer or shorter. Notice if there are any temperature changes, maybe one side of wherever you're noticing the breath is cooler and one side's a bit warmer. And seeing if it changes as you pay attention to it. You know, we can um, rest our attention in the sensations of the body. So maybe you're feeling pain or tingling, some energy moving. Just noticing what's most predominant in the body, if it feels okay to be with, if it's too painful or too overwhelming, go to the next most pre prominent sensation. And that's the practice for the next minute or so, is just to notice that the prominent object sometimes changes. Sometimes it changes in shape. Sometimes it's a totally different sensation. Watching the ever-changing nature of life flowing through us. These sensations are just life living through us.
And we can rest with the impermanence of what's happening in the mind. Noticing how thoughts and feelings change. And lastly, noticing impermanence at the ear door. Noticing how the sounds change as I read this quote. Um, this is a, an oft quoted Rilke gem. Be patient towards all that is unsolved in your heart and try to love the questions themselves like locked rooms and like books that are now written in a very foreign tongue. Do not now seek the answers which cannot be given you because you would not be able to live them. And the point is to live everything. Live the questions now. Perhaps you will then gradually without noticing it, live along some distant day into the answer. And so we're going to end by listening to the bell, noticing the impermanence of the bell as well. We'll start off loud and end off quiet. May the merits of our practice benefit all beings everywhere. Thank you friends for your time and your attention and your trust. We have eight minutes um, to chat if we want. Um, yeah, or to just, if you've got any reflections, thoughts, feelings, I would love to hear them.